Good morning, everybody. I'm uh, Colin Talbot, and I'm going to have a, yet another of my discussions about how governments are coping with the COVID crisis. Today, I'm joined by Jeff Mulgan, who played a significant role in British government in the early 2000s uh, you know, to do with planning for these sorts of crises. And I'll talk to Jeff about that in a moment. Since then, he's done all sorts of jobs, and his main interest more recently has been around uh, social innovation, which is what his latest book is about, but hopefully we'll talk about that at some other point, Jeff, um, because this morning I wanted to talk about the COVID crisis and how it relates to uh, what happened in the early years of the Labour government. But is there anything you want to say in terms of introduction now? You, you... Well, perhaps the only other thing to say, and what I'm doing a lot of work on at the moment with quite a few governments around the world is essentially around the design and operation of intelligence systems around the crisis. So one of my areas of work over many years, I've got a background in telecoms as well as public policy, has been the idea that in the next 10 or 20 years, on many, many fronts, governments will start assembling much more intelligent systems of observation, data, prediction, creativity, etc. Um, almost none have done that yet. Uh, weirdly, the crisis has achieved in a few weeks what otherwise might have taken many years, certainly in countries like Korea, Taiwan, Singapore. And so part of my uh, interest, apart from working with those governments, is also distilling what is being learned about how you organize intelligence, potentially so those can be applied to other things like care for the elderly or climate change or other big challenges in the near future. For me, that's one of the really exciting questions positive opportunities coming out of the crisis for government uh, though uh, the UK is somewhere behind I think the, the the best in the world we rather lost the capability of organizing these intelligence systems uh, using the best available tools yeah no it's, it's a very interesting area and one of the early interviews I did in this series was with the chief executive of net company in Denmark who were doing a lot of work with the Danish government on precisely that uh, which is, is very interesting. So if people are interested in that topic, they can go back and look at one of the earlier interviews as well. Okay, so today I wanted to talk about, you did a very interesting blog post on how governments respond to these sorts of major crises, not just pandemics, but financial crises and so on. And I wonder if we could just walk through that, and starting with the experience in the early Labour government when you had to deal with the crisis, first of all, the fuel strike, uh, which nearly crippled the country, and then foot and mouth disease, and then the reaction of that inside government. Yeah, well, this, this was in the late 90s, when in many ways Britain seemed extraordinarily stable and prosperous and everything was going fairly well, the economy was growing, there were no great social uh, divisions. And then these series of crises hit. One was, if you say, the fuel uh, tanker strike where it turned out that a small number of people blockading fuel depots could essentially bring the economy to a halt, could bring hospitals to a halt. Uh, Just-in-time production systems meant there were only a very few days uh, sort of stocks in, in reserve and that was a quite, quite a shock to the government. And then the foot and mouth disease in a sense uh, wreaked havoc on, on the countryside, led to millions of you know, animals being slaughtered and so we were asked, I was then running the strategy unit, we were asked to, to take a look at how, how should a government manage risk? What could we learn from big companies, oil companies, banks, pharma, from other governments around the world and from the UK's um, own experience? And the number of things were happening in tandem, including the creation of a civil contingencies capability, which could be brought into service in a, in a crisis. Uh, including a central capability, but also networks across the country. Um, and it, it, in a way, the framework which we then recommended and was put into place just ensured that almost every part of government was not just focused on delivery and implementation in the present, important that, as that is, but was all the time scanning for possible threats and risks and shocks, including high higher impact but low probability events and where appropriate was putting in place some mitigating uh, plans, thinking through what they would do uh, if the crisis hit, uh, doing scenarios, simulations, models, all sorts of things. Uh, and of course, for most of that time, pandemics was the top uh, uh, risk uh, on the list, and it has been for most of the last 20 years. And for a, a long time, I think there were pretty good mechanisms in place for um, crisis uh, preparation. One of the things I point out in the blog is uh, 
in a way, we were probably lulled into an excessive sense of success because in the five or six years after putting this machinery in place, there were no crises. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and that's always a very dangerous thing to think you sort of solved the problem of uncertainty. Um, but broadly speaking, that the system was being quite sophisticated in handling uh, uh, risks. Then a massive crisis hit, the financial crisis of 2007, eight. Uh, but in my view, one of the reasons why uh, it was, uh, at least initially, such a bad crisis is that one of the bits of government which hadn't really applied these mechanisms to its own work, oddly enough, was to a high-level economic policy. And there was almost a principle in government that you shouldn't do serious recession planning scenarios, etc., because if that leaked out to the markets, it would be taken as proof the government knew something was about to go horribly wrong, and then you would precipitate the very crisis you were trying to avoid. So that meant there was almost a, 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 a myopia, I think, about the likelihood of business cycles turning. Uh, I repeatedly, from about 2000 on, tried to commission uh, pieces of work on uh, preparing for downturns and, and, and was, was rebuffed. Now, thereafter, in fact, government did a, a you know, very good job and eventually did, um, you know, it, it acted with extraordinary alacrity in responding to the crisis. But initially, it was, uh, it was pretty blindsided. And then in the 2010s, as austerity has hit, the hollowing out, the closure of the pandemics, unit, uh, all, all these different sort of machineries and processes which were in some ways doing quite well in keeping the system attuned to high impact but low probability risk, that largely atrophied. Uh, there seems to be less and less attention. Um, uh, there were still some simulation exercises, but they weren't involving the most senior people. Uh, they, I think, weren't done anything like as well. And all of these, I think, uh, uh, along with with Brexit taking thousands of civil servants away from these other tasks explains why the UK government overall has been a pretty poor performer uh, during this crisis. That's really interesting. One of the things I found fascinating in your blog, <clears throat> which I hadn't really thought about very much, was uh, the degree of importance in scenario planning of getting senior leaders involved uh, to stress test not just the plans, but them, uh, to get them familiar with the sort of psychological stresses they would be put under in, in these sorts of uh, situations. I just wondered if you could expand on that a bit, because I thought that was really interesting. Well, I think that there, there are two sets of uh, a method which we were uh, impressed by in, in use around the world. One is simply sort of gaming, uh, so getting people who are quite senior, but to play different roles in a system and then to walk through what happens through a crisis or indeed a, 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 a reform. And these have been used a little bit in the UK system, for example, around health reforms. There was a very famous exercise uh, mod in the, early, in the 90s um, simulating how the internal market would work. And in the simulation, it crashed. <laughs> and therefore, the, the, you know, the, the, the report of the meeting was suppressed. And then when the policy was introduced, pretty much what had happened in the simulation happened in, in reality, which I think is a vindication why it is quite useful doing these sort of simulation exercises. And then for the more senior levels, I was very impressed by what Singapore did a lot, uh, certainly, again, from the early 90s onwards. Um, taking often, again, their most senior officials and ministers through, um, uh, again, simulations of things like the water supply being cut off or a financial crisis. Well, Singapore is quite a sort of paranoid country, so um, this is maybe sort of part of their DNA. But it helped them think through not just, as it were, the technical dynamics of a crisis, but also how people would feel, uh, how interests would play out, how conflicts might emerge between different departments, all the things which in reality in crises happen very quickly. But if you do your simulations in an over, say, technocratic or paper-based way, you simply don't see them. And I think one of the things we've really missed in the last few years is the senior people going through those kind of exercises around things like pandemics. And uh, for me, one of the symptoms of, uh, of this was the, the UK government's apparent strategy in, in early March, which was to rely on herd immunity, which was sort of announced in about mid-March, I guess it was, and within about 24 hours had completely unraveled. And even as they were saying it, I, I found in my mind, I, I say to myself, I cannot believe 
you've had a serious discussion or, or sort of work through of this with ministers or the media people or others in the room because they would have said, you know, there's no way this will last 24 hours in the current public opinion media environment that you are apparently willing to countenance hundreds of thousands of deaths will just seem like you've lost the plot. And that, of course, is what happened. And that's, again, that's why I think it is worth any government and any you know, ruling group of ministers carving out a bit of time for these sorts of exercises. They may seem a little bit of a waste of time because they're not dealing with the immediate issues, but they build up that kind of resilience and agility, which when the crisis does hit, and there always will be crises, uh, pays off in spades. But there's one final thing just, just to mention, which I think is important. Um, when I started this uh, project, uh, my boss then was Richard Wilson, who was head of the civil service, uh, as well as Tony Blair, who was prime minister. And Richard Wilson told me that in the 70s, I think I'm allowed to say this, he had, been, he had done an exercise trying to map the 300 biggest risks the UK faced. And they did a huge exercise listing all of these things. And his, in his account, at least, none of those actually happened. Lots of other things happened, but not those. And, and in a way, the broader moral of, of our exercises was don't fixate too much on hoping you can predict exactly what risk will hit you know, a yeah. SARS type virus from China that build into the system enough resilience and agility that when something does hit you, you can move very quickly and not be stuck in the frameworks uh, of the past. Yeah, that's very interesting. If we could just go back a little bit, I, I was fascinated by your point about who's in the room when you have these discussions about the policy operations. Uh, and it comes back to your interest in collective intelligence in government, because one of the points you make in the blog is that, uh, early in the crisis, the government seems to have relied exclusively on advice from epidemiologists who uh, may be very skilled in certain areas, but don't necessarily understand things like how the NHS works, how the, the administrative systems work and what the politics involved are. Um, and I, I just wondered if you could expand a bit on that about how important it is in terms of designing these exercises and generally the policy advice ecology in government to make sure you've got the right people on tap and not uh, not necessarily relying on too narrow a range of views. So I, I did a piece which was published um, earlier this week actually by Cambridge University which was meant to be a lecture last week at a conference which didn't happen and it was really about government as a brain. Um, how will we partly coming out of this crisis but also all sorts of other uh, uh, trends think more rigorously about the cognitive functioning of, of a government. Uh, and as I said earlier, this crisis has accelerated all sorts of ways governments are using uh, data, predictive analytics, models, and, and so on, which are part of the story. And what I point out in this, this lecture, which in some ways is obvious, but I think often gets missed in the design of advice, is that any government is having to um, orchestrate a whole series of different kinds of knowledge. There is the scientific knowledge of epidemiologists, there's the practical knowledge of people who've run hospitals, there's the statistical knowledge about you know, death rates, there's the economic knowledge about what's happening to businesses, uh, there's the public opinion knowledge, there's the political knowledge of what your party will bear. Um, and you can list all of these, they each have a separate profession around them and separate uh, methods. And by their nature, none of them trumps the other ones. For almost any decision, the decision maker has to be sufficiently fluent in those different kinds of knowledge and to know which ones to prioritize at different points. In the case of a, of a deep uh, pandemic, yes, certainly listen to the epidemiologists you know, first, but you know, very, very quickly you will need to be adding in your your knowledge about you know, social dynamics or psychology or mental health or you know, a, a business effects. And, and a lot of the discussion of science advice feels to me often like it's stuck about 30 or 40 years ago when it was, you, know, you have a committee of scientists who put in a sort of report which then goes into a civil service process and is, is or is not followed. What we're instead seeing is a constant integrative process of decision makers having to juggle incommensurable, very different kinds of knowledge in order to make decisions. Now, now, two or three things follow from that. One is it's vital that your source of advice do reflect all those different relevant kinds of knowledge and you don't over 
prioritize or fetishize, for example, one kind of model, like epidemiological models have probably had too much attention in some respects relative to, to other issues in this crisis. It's also vital your decision makers are competent at understanding, interrogating, and being skeptical about what the advisors are saying. And one of the things I point out in this piece is that, you know, 100 years ago, Oxford created the PPE course as an attempt to create, you know, a cadre of leaders who would have a slightly broader systemic view of how economies worked and so on. But that's completely anachronistic now. You need leaders who have sufficient understanding of, of systems, of complexity, of dynamics, that they can understand and be, as I say, question the advice being given by scientists. But instead, many of our leaders are lawyers or journalists and simply have had almost no experience of understanding these often quite ambiguous, messy types of knowledge uh, uh, that, that are, are feeding into them. And so I, I actually think we've got, there's a major task of education of next generation, both civil servants and political leaders, because I think, at least in this country, they've been found very wanting in terms of their underlying sort of base of knowledge. And then there's a whole set of more technical things about how within government you orchestrate the data, the models, etc., to help uh, as sort of decision support tools. But on all of these, um, I, I, I suspect you know, we will conclude a lot of our, our knowledge orchestration systems are, are really quite out of date now compared to what's needed for so not just pandemics, but also things like climate change or financial crises or you know, future jobs and skills. Many of the big issues facing governments now. Are there, are there governments internationally that are doing it better? Uh, you know, are there examples we ought to be studying to see if we can import some of the ideas to the UK? Well, I mean, for, for different bits, I think there are different governments around the world which definitely do do things better. Um, certainly on the data and digital side, there's no doubt the East Asian countries have done dramatically better than, than Europe or, or the US. Um, Taiwan is probably the most impressive. Korea, where I do a lot of work, has done phenomenally well in this uh, 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 crisis and very sophisticated merging of, of you know, use of different kind of data sets. On the knowledge orchestration, in the past, the UK was, was very good at having smart scientific knowledge feeding into uh, decision making. Um, and in some ways, we still have very good scientists. I think what's gone wrong in the system is it's become so secretive, so closed, and so unreflective. Uh, that it's probably worse than it was 10 or, or 20 years ago rather than better. And lots of other countries have been juggling with how to uh, integrate the, the, the medical, epidemiological and economic uh, inputs. I don't think there is a sort of standout example on that side. And then on internal knowledge management, there's a number of governments around the world trying to put in place much more systematic ways of mapping the knowledge inside the system. You know, how do you map not just the formal knowledge, background and experience, et cetera, of your hundreds of thousands of civil servants. So you can very quickly pull together teams who have, you know, know how to build a hospital in a week or know how to, um, uh, yeah, uh, create an emergency package of support for small business. Um, again, there are a number of governments, um, Canada, Singapore, uh, UAE, China, which are way ahead of the UK now in this orchestration of internal knowledge management and skills management within the system. Um, and hopefully we can learn from them quickly. <laughs> yes, indeed. That's been absolutely brilliant. Thanks very much, Jeff. Um, I'm sure I'll be coming back to talk to you about this and other issues in the future. Uh, but thanks very much for joining me today. Thank you very much, Colin.